For the first time in history, China's military has deployed all its aircraft carriers to sea simultaneously. This provides insight into how the China might position its ships in the event of, say, an attack on Taiwan, the Telegraph reports. According to the news agency, over the past weekend, all three Chinese aircraft carriers, the former Soviet Liaoning, its locally produced sister ship Shandong, and the newest, largest, and most advanced Chinese-made carrier Fujian, were at sea. It is known that Fujian is undergoing trials in the Yellow Sea. Shandong was in the South China Sea west of Taiwan with its escort, while Liaoning and its escort were in the Philippine Sea east of Taiwan. Interestingly, Fujian is not yet officially part of China's military fleet. However, once it joins, China will become the world's second largest aircraft carrier power, surpassing the dual deck Royal Navy and the Indian Navy. Nevertheless, China will still lag behind the U.S. Navy. Moreover, China's carriers are smaller than those of the U.S. Liaoning and Shandong, have a displacement of about 60,000 tons, while Fujian is around 70,000 tons. Their air component is smaller and significantly, only Fujian is equipped with catapults, three of them which can launch J-15 fighters and in the future J-35s at full weight. As The Telegraph notes, the fact that China has deployed three aircraft carriers at once is ominous for Taiwan. In June, it was reported that Taiwan, facing threats from China, planned to conduct military exercises close to actual combat conditions. One of the unique elements of these drills will be nighttime training uncommon for the Taiwanese army. Recently, a documentary series released by Chinese state media has imagined what an invasion of Taiwan by China might look like. The 20-minute sixth episode of Quenching, aired by China Central Television, features a nationalistic display of military power, including drone-assisted operations, missile drills and electronic warfare exercises as part of a larger simulated assault on Taiwan's defenses. The episode also opens with a Chinese soldier expressing regret over the ongoing separation between China and Taiwan while yearning for national unification, a recurring theme in Chinese state media. The documentary delves into how the China's People's Liberation Army would use drones and helicopters to move troops to the island. Footage depicts fierce resistance from Taiwan's forces, equipped with portable anti-aircraft missiles similar to those supplied by the United States. President Joe Biden declared the U.S. must not retreat from the world as he delivered his final address to the UN General Assembly on Tuesday as Israel and Hezbollah militants in Lebanon edged toward all-out war and Israel's bloody operation against Hamas in Gaza neared the one-year mark. The Pentagon announced Monday that it was sending a small number of additional US troops to the Middle East to supplement the roughly 40,000 already in the region. All the while, the White House insists Israel and Hezbollah still have time to step back and de-escalate. Full-scale war is not in anyone's interest, Biden said, and despite escalating violence, a diplomatic solution is the only path to peace. Biden had a hopeful outlook for the Middle East when he addressed the UN just a year ago. In that speech, Biden spoke of a sustainable, integrated Middle East coming into view. At the time, economic relations between Israel and some of its Arab neighbors were improving with implementation of the Abraham Accords that Israel signed with Bahrain, Morocco and the United Arab Emirates during the Trump administration. Biden's team helped resolve a long-running Israel-Lebanon maritime dispute that had held back gas exploration in the region. And Israel-Saudi normalization talks were progressing, a game-changing alignment for the region if a deal could be landed. Eighteen days later, Biden's Middle East hopes came crashing down. Hamas militants stormed into Israel killing 1,200, taking some 250 hostage, and spurring a bloody war that has killed more than 41,000 Palestinians in Gaza and led the region into a complicated downward spiral. Now, the conflict is threatening to metastasize into a multi-front war and leave a lasting scar on Biden's presidential legacy. Israel and Hezbollah traded strikes again Tuesday as the death toll from a massive Israeli bombardment climbed to nearly 560 people and thousands fled from southern Lebanon. It's the deadliest barrage since the 2006 Israel-Hezbollah war. 
Israel has urged residents of southern Lebanon to evacuate from homes and other buildings where it claimed Hezbollah has stored weapons, saying the military would conduct extensive strikes against the militant group. Hezbollah, meanwhile, has launched dozens of rockets, missiles and drones into northern Israel in retaliation for strikes last week that killed a top commander and dozens of fighters. Dozens were also killed last week and hundreds more wounded after hundreds of pagers and walkie-talkies used by Hezbollah militants exploded, a sophisticated attack that was widely believed to have been carried out by Israel. Israel's leadership launched its counterattacks at a time of growing impatience with the Iranian-backed Hezbollah's persistent launching of missiles and drones across the Israel-Lebanon border after Hamas started the war with its brazen attack on October 7. Biden also talked about artificial intelligence and the need for the world to act now in putting up guard rails to protect citizens of the world from any dangers it may pose and the need to uphold our principles as we seek to responsibly manage the competition with China so it does not veer into conflict. I put forward with Qatar and Egypt a ceasefire and hostage deal been endorsed by the UN Security Council. Now is the time for the parties to finalize its terms, bring the hostages home, and secure security for Israel and Gaza free of Hamas' grip, ease the suffering in Gaza, and end this war. Since October 7, we've also been determined to prevent a wider war that engulfs the entire region. Hezbollah, unprovoked, during the October 7 attack, launching rockets into Israel. Almost a year later, too many on each side of the Israeli-Lebanon border remain displaced. Full-scale war is not in anyone's interest. Even if the situation has escalated, a diplomatic solution is still possible. In fact, it remains the only path to lasting security to allow the residents from both countries to return to their homes and their borders safely. And that's what, we're working, that's what we're working tirelessly to achieve. As we look ahead, we must also address the rise of violence against innocent Palestinians on the West Bank and set the conditions for a better future, including a two-state solution for the world where Israel enjoys security and peace, the full recognition and normalized relations with all its neighbors, where Palestinians live in security, dignity, and self-determination in a state of their own. Progress toward peace will put us in a stronger position to deal with the ongoing threat posed by Iran. Together, we must deny oxygen to, terror, to its terrorist proxies, which have called for more October 7th and ensure that Iran will never, ever obtain a nuclear weapon. Vision to reflect today's world, not yesterday. It's time to move forward. The Security Council, like the UN itself, needs to go back to the job of making peace of brokering deals to end wars and suffering. This and to stop the spread of the most dangerous weapons, of stabilizing troubled regions in East Africa, from East Africa to Haiti, to Kenya-led mission that's working alongside the Haitian people to turn the tide. We also have a responsibility to prepare our citizens for the future. We'll see more technological change, I argue, in the next two to 10 years, we have in the last 50 years. Artificial intelligence is gonna change our ways of life, our ways of work, and our ways of war. If people need more than the absence of war. As AI grows more powerful, it must grow also, also must grow more responsive to our collective needs and values. Benefits of all must be shared equitably should be harnessed to a narrow, not deepened digital divide. Second, will we ensure that AI supports rather than undermines the core principles that human life has value and all humans deserve dignity? We must make certain that the awesome capabilities of AI will be used to uplift and empower everyday people, not to give dictators more powerful shackles on, human, on the human spirit, in the years ahead, there may, be, there may be, may well be no greater test of our leadership than how we deal with AI. The United States is unabashed 
pushing back against unfair economic competition, against military coercion of other nations in the, in the South China Sea, and maintaining peace and stability across the Taiwan Straits, and protecting our most advanced technologies so they cannot be used against us or any of our partners. At the same time, we're going to continue to strengthen our network of alliances and partnerships across the Indo-Pacific. These partnerships are not against any nation. They're building blocks for a free, open, secure, and peaceful Indo-Pacific. We also need to uphold our principles as we seek to responsibly manage the competition with China so it does not veer into conflict. We stand ready to cooperate on urgent challenges for the good of our people and the people everywhere. We recently resumed cooperation with China to stop the flow of deadly synthetic narcotics. I appreciate the collaboration. It matters for the people of my country and many others around the world.